Yeah, if you could just do that again. Please, Ben. That will be good. Yeah, go up there faster as well. I'd, I'd, I'm needing you to do that once more. <laughs> okay. Today, we're looking at how you move the bike to smooth out the trail. Some call it absorbing, squashing, pumping, and most people do it without even realizing they're doing it. I'm gonna detail the intricacies of how you move the bike underneath you to maintain control no matter what you're riding. Unless you're riding Champre World Cup Track 2007, that thing was nearly impossible. Sam Hill almost figured it out, but even Australian wizards have their limits. Let's begin. When riding on smooth trails, you don't actually have to do much to remain composed and in control of your bike. But as things get chunkier, steeper, and more technical, it gets harder and harder to stay in charge. Suspension is amazing at smoothing out the small to medium-sized obstacles, but when things get bigger, faster, you have to utilize the arms and legs to smooth things out. If you don't, you'll just get bounced around rubberneck at the mercy of the features you're hitting. When watching a skilled rider nail a chunky section, it almost looks like they're doing nothing. But slow things down and suddenly you can see how much is going on. Moving the bike up, down, forwards and backwards allows a skilled rider to keep their upper body and head separated from the action. It's the separation that is the key to remaining smooth and controlled, no matter the terrain. Let's start with the absolute basic rules so we're all clear on what's going on before things get all gnarly and complicated. If the goal is to make sure your head stays nice and stable, then the plan is to make the bike follow the shape of the train while your head just floats along above it. That means if the ground goes up, you allow the bike to come up by bending the arms and then the legs, just enough so that the bike moves but your head doesn't. Obviously, normally you'd actually send it off a feature like this, but just allow me to establish the basics here. Come on. The flip side of this and the much more commonly required technique is when the ground dips down away from you. For this, you would straighten the arms and then the legs to allow the bike to follow the ground without your head dropping. The movements for the legs and arms are approximately equal to the size of the feature in this simple example. The timing is dictated by when your wheels pass over the feature with your arms controlling the front wheel and legs controlling the back wheel. Unless something has gone very wrong, the arms should always move before the legs and the timing between the two will vary according to the speed you're going and the wheelbase of your bike. From the default boss stance, you don't actually have a lot of downward push available to you as the legs are almost straight already. What happens if there's a dip in the trail bigger than the amount of downward movement that you actually have available? Well, if you're going fast enough, you'll just catch some sweet air, which isn't always a problem in itself, but the longer you're in the air, the harder you're going to touch back down. And if there's a big juicy feature like a rock or a hole that you might land in, then you better brace yourself. More often than not, getting the wheels back on the ground early is preferred and you just have to do a bit of prep work before the feature. By lowering yourself down into the bike before the dip, you then have much more available travel in the arms and legs to push the bike down through that dip. Again, the flip side is also true, so if we were to imagine trying to fully absorb a big takeoff because you're scared of your wheels coming off the ground, you would then stand up tall on the tiptoes to give you all the room available underneath you just before the takeoff. Then you let the bike come up into you to absorb the feature. This means you can completely neutralize features that are the same size as the amount of movement you have available, which is lucky for me with the big old noodle limbs. I can see it now. It's all coming together in your head. It's all making sense. But wait, you think. We're not all noodle limb gigantors like giraffe features here. We can't just absorb entire mountains at our own leisure, you say. You're correct. And that leads me perfectly on to what you do for features that are larger than what you can physically deal with. Quite often the preferred method would just be to jump the feature, especially if it's a gap jump. And we will cover jumping in a future bit, so stay tuned for that. 
but let's just say you want to absorb this feature to the best of your abilities. Usually for these bigger features, there is a transition at the base where the ground starts to come up. If you were to start absorbing here, you'd very quickly run out of room, get rudely introduced to your back tire and proceed to be violently spat into the air. And then it's anyone's guess where you'll land. Fun fact, that's actually what caused G. Atherton to crash and dislocate his hip back in 2017 when absorbing that first jump at the Fort William World Cup. Bloody 29ers, eh? Also, as speed and severity of the feature increases, you will begin to come off the ground, even if your technique is perfect. An additional movement of pushing the bike forwards as you crest the tip of the feature is required. This is because most of your weight goes through the pedals and into the back wheel during this maneuver, loading up the rear suspension, which can then cause you to rotate forward if the front wheel is off the ground, potentially causing an out the front door scenario. Those are the general rules for bike movement, which when utilized properly can turn the chunkiest mess into a smooth FM. When done correctly, you can see from a profile view watching someone that the bike closely follows the terrain while the head just glides along in a much more direct path. You can think of it like your upper body taking a shortcut through the chunky stuff. So those of you that like uh, cutting the course will get a wee jolly out of that. Let's take these rules to a couple features on track, point out the common mistakes and make sure you can apply these techniques properly to elevate your riding game. So this is a feature on my track that catches out a lot of people, mainly due to it being built very badly. It was me, I built it. <laughs> so it is fallen over a tree, dirt piled up on each side, it's like a spine. And uh, I would say this is something you really want to absorb. So if you did nothing in terms of technique, you would find yourself just getting sent sky high in the air, huge nose dive, you'll probably have a bad time. And we actually found a peak from a helmet on the ground uh, just after this feature. So someone has had a bad time, so it definitely happens. Looking at this, it's a big feature I want to absorb, so I know I need to prepare before it. So I'm going to stand up tall just before it. So I've got loads of room underneath me to soak it up. As the ground comes up, I'm then going to let the bike come up into me, bending my arms and then my legs. And your, your goal when you're doing this is you want to hit your maximum amount of absorption just as your front wheel is at the crest. So the timing for when you do that is something you're going to have to play with. But you want to be coming front wheel right on the tip just as you hit that maximum amount of absorption. Because this feature kicks me, and I know it does, I know I need to push the bike forwards, which moves my weight back in relation to the bike. This helps to stop me from getting spat forward too much. But even, even with good technique, this is just so kicky. You always get a little bit of a nosedive off of it. So you come over the crest, push the bike forwards, bum hovering over the back wheel. And then once you're clear, aim to just pull the bike back underneath you, ready for landing. So things to watch out for is trying to absorb things too soon and running out of room. Like you try and soak it up, you run out of room, bum hits the back wheel and it just spits you forward. Another thing to watch out for is, to for is forgetting to set up on the way in. So forgetting to get nice and tall so you got more room. And then again, you end up running out of room too soon. So it's all one fluid movement. So it's stand tall and soak it up all in one fluid movement. That'll take a little bit of practice to get the hang of. So obviously that's all beautiful, excellent technique. That's how you deal with that. One other thing you can do, uh, if, if it's on a track and you're wanting to do it quicker and there's a feature that's causing you bother and it's holding you back, remove it from the equation. So what you can do is there's a little uh, bump just back from me. It's only about this big. It's enough that if you bunny hop off of it, you can bunny hop clean over this use that as a down slope. So sketchy, I wouldn't recommend it, but you could do that. Now I know I've got a pre-jump this one. Let's go. So here we have a prime big old dip on the track. Uh, when I found this rock and I was originally kind of clearing this bit of track, I was like, oh sick, nice big drop. But actually it's steep, but you can roll down it. So let's go over the technique for when the track dips away from you and what you do to control it. Just bear with me just, just a second. <laughs> Woo. 
So this is a feature bigger than the amount of movement I have. So to roll this, I'm gonna to have to treat this like it's, I'm pitching the bike down into a steep slope. So I'm gonna prepare coming in. Coming up to this feature, just before I get to it, I'm gonna lower myself down into the bike. And like we did for the other feature, timing wise, you want to do this as late as possible because you don't want to come up to the drop all squished up in your bike, ready for it and bumbling about and all the stuff on the run up. Pointless, you want to do it just at the last moment. So you come in, nice casual body position, just as you get to it, dip down into the bike. And what I find the steeper the feature you're going to roll down, the more you actually dip forward into the bike. So I actually get my weight forward and it, I find it helps me to then drive the bike down the feature. Common mistake a lot of people do in the run up is they have their weight further back, being a bit defensive. And what happens is, is as you pitch the bike down into it, because your weight's further back, the back wheel just comes up and pats you in the bum. It's like pulling the back brake on, pitches your weight forward, not advised. So getting the weight forward, I find really helps you to angle the bike down into it and stops those bum slaps. In essence, you're pitching the bike down into the slope, not pushing the bike out in front of you. And as the front wheel hits the bottom and you want to level the bike out, you straighten the legs, drive the back wheel through the transition and then settle back into that center position. The big thing that I think people forget to do in the run out is really focusing on straightening those legs. It's easy to just kind of stay hanging back and then your weight's too far back on the run out. And you get a little bit of that passenger moment we talked about in the last episode. So the key things for everything we've talked about today, if the ground comes up towards you and you want to soak it up, you let the bike come up into you. If you need to prepare, because it's a bigger feature, you stand up tall beforehand. For the flip side, for the ones that go down, you want to push the bike down the feature. If it's a big feature, you prepare before it. And the timing for all of these things, you're trying to do it in one fluid movement and doing it just before the feature, rather than preparing a long way before. Although when you're practicing, sometimes it is good to get ready nice and early so you don't rush your brain trying to think about it all in a short space of time. Try those things, watch out for the bum trying to hit you in the back wheel if that's happening. Try setting the weight a bit further forward beforehand and don't let the bike get away from you in the exits of these things. So use those skills, hopefully you'll be able to neutralize all these obstacles and stay nice and controlled. Is that everything? I think that was everything. <laughs> Hopefully you learned something today and if you did I'd appreciate a sneaky thumbs up. <laughs> oh god damn it. I wish I could do funny things and not find it funny. <laughs> like if you've got any questions I'm going to be hanging around in the comments for about an hour after this goes live. Fire your questions down below and I'll try to answer them the best I can. Now it's all up to you. Don't, don't you dare. <laughs> Just carry on with your life and not give this a second thought. Think back to some trails that you've ridden where you've been barked out of control. Go back there, try these techniques, conquer those sections, become a better rider, subscribe to this channel, and I'll see you in the next video. It's on advanced braking. You don't want to miss it. Don't want to miss it.